everyone. Thank you for coming here today. Appreciate it. It's Saturday afternoon, and um, you, you guys are all are all in high school, and so you just spend an entire week in classes, um, I presume. And, uh, and here you are on Saturday in a classroom setting. However, um, <clears throat> I do believe that what we'll be talking about today will be slightly more interesting than what you learn in school. Um, only slightly, though. So. Uh, my name is Jonathan Marcantoni. I am uh, a publisher. I own uh, La Casita Grande Press, which is an imprint dedicated to uh, Latino and Caribbean authors. Um, this data that you see on here is from our website, and I'm going to get into that later on in the presentation. Uh, I'm also an instructor at UCCS uh, for both the English and the uh, Women's studies departments. Um, a little bit about my background, and I'll probably be, uh, I'll be pulling different things from, from my life throughout the presentation as well, but uh, just a brief overview. Um, I am an Army veteran. I graduated from the University of, Col uh, University of Colorado, the University of Tampa in uh, 2009 with a degree in Spanish studies. Um, 2009 was not a very good time to, uh, to find work. And so after, uh, after working a few not so satisfactory jobs, I ended up in the Army. Um, and from there, uh, during my time in the Army, I was also editing. Um, I started professionally editing back in 2004 when I was only 19 years old, actually. Um, that was the first time I, I sold a script to a production company in Atlanta. It was the first time I made money off of my writing, and uh, shortly thereafter I also started editing. Um, so uh, I'm 33 now, so I've been doing this for about 14 years. Um, during that time, uh, as you, you can probably guess, I've had a lot of ups and downs professionally because the publishing industry is not the most financially secure industry, and writing is not the most financially secure uh, art form, um, as if there is a financially secure art form. Uh, so, <clears throat> as a result, I've had to balance um, home life. I have a 14-year-old, and I have uh, an 8 and a 5-year-old as well. Uh, I've been married uh, for almost 10 years. So all of this was during my 20s. And so I was having to juggle family, profession, and my creative drive all at the same time. Now prior to that, I come from a theater background. I started taking acting classes when I was six, started doing theater when I was eight, um, like actual productions when I was eight. And I did that up into my uh, early 20s. So, um, so it's been a very varied life. And in this varied life, I've had the opportunity to be both the uh, performer or uh, on-camera talent, as they would say in the film world, um, as well as the behind-the-scenes person. Um, during my time working in publishing and working as an editor, uh, I worked for two different publishing houses, one called Savant Books and the other called I Know Publishing. And when I worked at Ino, um, which is a terrible name for a publishing house, by the way, it's awful. Like he actually he picked a word that is a ger is obscure Middle German word spelled A I G N O S. And so whenever we would do any kind of thing for the publishing house, we had to explain what the name was, how to pronounce it, what it meant. It was ridiculous. So um, lesson one. <laughs> Lesson one, if you're naming something, name something that people are not going to spend the entire time just asking you to explain it. Um, so, so anyway, when I was at I Know, I was actually an editor-in-chief. So you have, in publishing houses, you have the, in the editorial department, your basic editor who does um, line edits which is very detailed editing that's going through character and story and dialogue and structure. is much more thorough editing. And then you have um, copy editors who all they do is check grammar. Um, 
so as editor-in-chief, typically the way the editorial department works is that the editor-in-chief decides what emphasis is going to be placed on the books. So there's some publishing, or I should say most publishing houses actually don't place a lot of emphasis on the line editing. They don't place a lot of emphasis on very in-depth editing. Uh, whereas most of them instead will focus on the copy editors, if they have editors at all. They'll focus on copy editors and they just want very superficial editing. So what this does a lot of times is it creates um, a propensity for picking up books that are kind of simplistic and not necessarily all that challenging because there's a belief in the publishing industry that you want to appeal to as broad an audience as possible in order to sell as many books. And the more challenging the book is, the smaller the audience is going to be. So how does this relate to our particular topic today? This way of thinking in which uh, companies are looking at books as solely solely from a financial standpoint, and solely from a, solely from a marketing standpoint, really, where their concern is much more how many books can we sell, how big of an audience can we reach. Um, because the emphasis is placed on that, content ends up being uh, sacrificed. So what this, also leads to is that your gender and your racial background, your ethnic background, ends up getting lumped into a stereotypical category. And these categories, while they affect everybody, it doesn't matter what your background is or your race, it affects them in different ways. Uh, one thing that creates an imbalance in the publishing world is that most publishers are white males. Most editors are white females. And they also tend to come from, socioeconomically, come from the upper middle class to the upper class. Because when you're poor, and, uh, or even lower middle class, being able to do a 40 hour a week internship that doesn't pay you for a year is not very feasible. Um, I come from a come from a background where we actually kind of fluctuated class-wise. Uh, when I was a little, little kid, we were lower middle class. And then by the time I got to a teenager, we had elevated kind of into more of the upper stratosphere. Then my parents got divorced and we went right down to the lower classes. We went right down um, to living in very poor situations. And I've covered, I've kind of hovered um, to some degree in the poor to lower middle class range ever since. I could not afford to do unpaid inter internships. I could not afford to do um, even minimum wage jobs. If I had a minimum wage job, I had to supplement it with one or two other jobs. And there were different times in my life, um, including when I was only 19, 20, 21 years old, I was working three jobs, um, plus doing freelance work. So when you're in that situation, you're not able to access things like internships. You're not able to do things like galas or conferences with, you know, a lot, a lot of conferences, particularly literary ones, the lowest price to get into them will be over $100. Some of them are in the thousands. Um, so I couldn't have access to those things. I didn't have the grades to be in an Ivy League school. So I had to work with what I had. Now at that time, we did not, the, the internet was around, but it was not as expansive nor as accessible as it is today. Um, also, things like blogging platforms were either pricey in order to actually get all the different functions of the blog, 
or they just didn't have much of an audience. Blogging really didn't take off until the late 2000s, uh, 2009, 2010. That was really when blogging started taking off. So I'm talking a few years before that. So it wasn't exactly viable. Also, most of the people who were using blogging platforms were white people, or white middle class people. That's who was predominantly using them. So this is completely different from what you have today, where today blogging platforms are used heavily by people of color. They're used heavily by people of all different class uh, strata. And so, um, and so seeing this evolution and seeing what was going on in the publishing industry where if you were a white male, you can pretty much write whatever you want to. You can write in any kind of genre, any kind of style. There are outlets for you. If you're a white female, um, you have a lot more, uh, more rigidness in what you can do because females are expected to write really one of three things. Either poetry, typically confessional poetry or uh, personal poetry, memoirs, or romances. And that is what women have been largely uh, sequestered to. But within those three things, they can pretty much do it however they want to. They have a lot of freedom. White women are given um, still a lot of freedom, even though a creative freedom, even though not as much as white men. And then, the darker your skin gets, and the more ethnic sounding your name gets, the more foreign you seem, the less and less and less narratives you're able to tell. Typically, in this country, if you are any sort of immigrant, whether you're from the Middle East, or you're from Latin America, from Africa, if you're, I should say, any dark-skinned immigrant, um, the expected subject matter for you to write if you want to break into mainstream publishing is an immigration narrative, where it's about your identity. Now, these immigration identity narratives are framed in only one way, which is the pursuit of the American dream and that America is, in one way or another, your savior. So you might have heard of the phrase white savior. The white savior is a narrative device that is often employed um, in stories from Western Europe and the United States where Uh, where, while there might be brown and black people in the narrative, the main character is a white person, typically a white man. And in order for the brown character's problems to be solved, the white man has to solve them. So while the brown characters might participate to varying degrees, um, in solving the problem as well, it is the white man who ultimately solves the problem. In immigration narratives, that white man becomes a country, becomes the United States as the white savior. And this is the narrative that is pushed upon especially Latin American writers, especially Latinos. Um, <clears throat> So, how do you combat that? These structures that I'm talking about are systemic. So how do you combat that? Well, what I found um, with the expansion of these blogging platforms and also the expansion of social media to be focused on social justice matters and to have narratives driven by people of color is that we are now in an era where there is enormous demand for narratives that don't follow the white savior narrative. Narratives that go outside of immigrant narratives. 
and identity narratives. And because of the expanded accessibility of blogging platforms, you're able to actually start telling these stories for free and without having to worry about, um, about appeasing a gatekeeper, an editor or a publisher who may not be from your background or may not understand your background or may not want to even know about your background unless it fits those previously mentioned narratives. So this kind of brings us to the meat and bones of our, of our presentation at this point. Before I get into that, are there any questions or feedback from what we've discussed so far? No? All right, so in 2016, I started uh, La Casita Grande. La Casita Grande, which means the little big house. Um, anybody in here happen to watch Doctor Who? It is actually a Doctor Who reference. Because Doctor Who, he flies around space and time in the TARDIS, which has the appearance of a police box. And, and so whenever anybody steps into it, and it's his ship, um, they always mention that it's bigger on the inside than on the outside, because it's a massive ship. Um, so, like I said, the Grande is a reference to the Tartans. It is. So, um, so anyway, uh, like I said, the Grande, I actually proposed like I said, the Grande to a few different publishing houses, and they all passed um, due to <clears throat> due to the sentiment that there wouldn't be enough people interested in a publishing house geared solely toward writers of color that did not adhere to the standard norms. And these rejections weren't solely from white-run publishing houses. They were actually from Latino-run publishing houses. They were the ones that said no. Um, my book, uh, King of Seventh Avenue, was published by a, a press in, based in San Antonio, Texas called Black Rose Writing, which is a white-run press. Um, I pitched the idea to them because they were expanding and starting imprints, and they loved the idea. So I tell that story because I don't want to give the impression, since a lot of what I was saying previously was very race and class based, I don't want to give the impression that white people don't ever help anybody out other than their own or they don't help out minorities who, unless those minorities like kiss their butt. Now, I don't want to give that impression, it's not true. There are those people, they do exist, but they also exist in our own community as well. <laughs> so, um, just wanted to, to clarify that. So, Black Rose Writing gave us this opportunity. Now, I am from um, Fajardo, Puerto Rico, which is a small town um, in northeastern Puerto Rico, and <clears throat> even though I, let me rephrase that, pretty much everything that I've written has some sort of reference to Fajardo. Every, almost everything that I've written has a reference to Puerto Rico, or it takes place in Puerto Rico, or the characters are all Puerto Rico. And I have been told throughout the whole time that I've been writing, my whole writing career, um, that the only way I would be able to get a wide readership is if I changed my characters to be in white characters. And if instead of setting it in Puerto Rico, I set it in the US. And I've been told this. I've also been told that because I don't write um, in the quote unquote standard way or industry accepted way, that I don't even know how to write. I have been told that. Oh, you clearly don't know how to write. You clearly don't know how to tell a story. I've been told this by people. I was actually, funny enough, um, I was actually told that about a book of mine that I had written about <coughs> two days after someone with a best-selling book wrote a glowing review for me. <laughs> it's just saying how wonderful and amazing my writing was. And then two days later, this other person 
um, who wasn't as well known, told me that they didn't think I even knew I read. So um, that's the kind of discouragement. And there's been far worse things that I've actually been told about my writing. Um, but that's the kind of discouragement that writers of color experience all the time. All the time. They experience it in school. They experience it um, at home sometimes. They experience it at, if they go into writing groups, they go to conferences, which are more often than not run by white people. And I'm going to add another thing. The publishing industry is, like you guys have heard of the military industrial complex. Well, there's what I call the publishing MFA complex, which is basically that MFA programs, um, they are promoted as programs that will get you published. That's how they bring in people to sign up for them. Um, now, there are some MFA programs, though, that are honest about what they can actually do, where they will say straight up, this program is basically so you can teach creative writing classes. There are a few that actually will just explicitly say that, and those ones are being honest. An MFA degree is so you can teach creative writing classes. That is what it is for. They will teach you things about the publishing industry in there, but unless you go to an MFA program, say, in like New York City, where they have an internship program with a publishing house, um, you're not really going to get your foot in the door by simply having that degree. So that being said, MFA programs, what they teach, generally speaking, there are a few exceptions to this, but generally speaking, what they teach their students is what publishers want to see, style-wise and content-wise and structure-wise. Um, and they get writers to write in these particular ways in order for them to get published by a larger publishing house. Now, what typically happens is people get the MFA degree, and then they try to get published. They find out it's much harder than they were ever told in school, and that simply saying you have an MFA doesn't mean that you're going to get picked up. And so what do those people end up doing? They end up teaching creative writing courses at, a, at an MFA program. <laughs> So, but the publishing houses do want the type of writing that those MFA programs are producing. That's the thing. So they kind of scratch each other's back. Now, if you're able to break out um, using those particular methods, more power to you. But you are in a minority. The majority of people they can go 20 years submitting to publishing houses and never get published. That's the majority of people. So when you become, or I'm sorry, when you are a writer of color, those odds become even greater. So I was thinking about all these different things when I proposed La Casita Grande. What makes La Casita Grande different? What makes it different is that one, we're dedicated to actually training our writers, to actually giving them professional development and teaching them how to actually reach audiences and how to build an audience and build a brand and how to do it around who they are as artists, not what the industry wants them to be as artists. So we're already trying to get them out of the mindset of playing by these uh, prescribed rules and succeeding in it. We place a lot of emphasis on doing events, emphasis on getting reviews, and emphasis on doing interviews. As well as emphasis on not relying on the 10 or 20 people that you know personally, but expanding outwards, trying to meet people who are different than them, people they've never met, becoming more sociable in doing so. And one of the ways that we do this is, while we have our book side, and we do a lot of things with our book side, 
that is only for Latino and Caribbean writers. Well, there's not actually, numbers-wise, I mean, you're thinking about there's seven billion people in the world, um, and maybe only a few million are writers. And when you think of writers of Latino and Caribbean descent, it becomes progressively smaller. So you're talking about maybe a few hundred thousand people. So you can't just rely on that. So we have the LCG Lounge in order to address that issue. Because these problems with the publishing industry don't just affect Latinos and, and Caribeños, Caribbeans. It affects everybody. And so the lounge is a space for people of all backgrounds. And, um, and it's not just writers. It's also filmmakers, playwrights, poets, musicians, visual artists. We bring in everybody. So that is what makes La Casita Grande different. Now, because of my previous standing as an editor-in-chief and the many years that I've been uh, doing publishing, when La Casita Grande launched, um, it launched with news coverage from NBC and Publishers Weekly. So that helped us a great deal. Now, what, how, that helped us a great deal, but that was a many years thing building up to that. So how does this apply to you? How do you this apply to somebody who's just in high school or freshman in college, or really any grade um, in college? This is how. <clears throat> now, La Casita Grande, we use Squarespace. Squarespace is an absolutely wonderful platform. Uh, very user friendly, gives you a lot of options as far as like doing videos, doing um, multimedia, and also with building pages. As you can see, also Squarespace has these lovely analytics. All right. So this is from the last year. We've gotten 14,000 views in the last year, or in 2017, I mean. And we, and we also were viewed by all these countries. It's a really long list. <laughs> And all these countries visited our website. Some 50, over 50 countries. All right, so we're able to track this. Now Squarespace costs about $30 a month. Now, for those of you who don't have jobs or who um, don't have the extra money to spend $30 to have a website every month, um, this might not be so feasible. But there is, there are websites like WordPress and Blogger, where Blogger is actually part of Gmail. If you have a Gmail account, you can make a Blogger account. And so these are actually free sites. And that's in Spanish, yes. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's just like saying how you're supposed to, it's just telling you about the website. It's all All right, so let's have it on the WordPress. WordPress, you see, they do have, um, some higher levels where they want you to pay. But for the most part, you can get pretty much the same, uh, the same apps and the same tools for free. Um, or $4, which most of us can afford $4 a month. So you here in Colorado Springs, completely unknown, you don't have this base or these years of experience, but what you do have is a distinct point of view, and you have distinct interests. And let's say, where are you from? Colorado. Colorado, but like ethnically. Ethnically, I'm mixed. You're mixed? Black, white, Japanese, I'm, I'm the world. <laughs> You're the world. You're the world. You got it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, that's really cool. That's, that's a very cool mix right there. So, let's say 
Um, do you like sci-fi, fantasy? Let's say you want to do like some crime writing, right? And you want to make a blog that's centered around crime fiction. Now, being mixed, you have a wide range of experiences and probably some very different perspectives. Um, also being a woman, you have a very distinct perspective on the world. So let's say you want to do crime fiction by women, and maybe, maybe you do want to place an emphasis on women of color, but not exclusively. So you can create a blog where maybe you put up your stories at first. Start sharing it on your social media platforms, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And after a little while, you start meeting people who are also interested in this. Or if you have friends who also want to tell crime stories, you start taking their submissions. Um, start looking their submissions over, making sure they're edited well, um, not a bunch of typos in them, make sure the stories make sense. So you're working on quality there. Once your friends know that they can submit stories to you and you'll put it on your blog and you'll share it with all these different people, maybe they'll tell their friends. Or maybe you can find uh, different groups, like crime writers groups, there's a bunch of them, crime writing groups, and you can tell them about your website and you can start advertising on their, on their um, social media for free and you just share it on the pages. Right there, you're already building up an audience. Now this audience might only be a few dozen people at first, but if you're putting out really good stories, then it's going to grow. Now, let's say at a certain point you've, you've gotten these followers, you're getting submissions from friends and starting getting them from strangers, you can start doing series. So, for instance, in our lounge. In our, in our lounge, we do different series throughout the year. So, one of our series is the Meet the Publisher series. So, right, the Publisher Resource Friends. So we do the, the Meet the Publisher series, where we interview publishers about what they offer their authors, how they treat their authors, things they do for them. And then we publish the interview with them. And we also talk about like, the books they have coming out and all. And then we created this publisher resource for writers, which has all those interviews, the series interviews. So you can do something similar. You can do, say, a series where you want Colorado Springs crime fiction series. And you can put a call out online for crime, uh, crime writers right here in Colorado Springs. See how that goes. Maybe you only get three or four submissions the first time you do it. And then say, you know, you want to do another one. Let's do, well, let's do a series for Pueblo. And then you start finding different multimedia platforms, not multimedia, internet platforms that are for Pueblo, Pueblo based groups and you reach out to them. And then you can do the same thing for Denver, and so on and so forth. And then maybe, after a while, you know, once you're getting more and more submissions for that, maybe you gain some popularity, you branch out to New Mexico, branch out to Utah, to Nevada, to California. And next thing you know, you're becoming regional, and from regional to national. Now, this could take a year or two. Um, it's not immediate. But guess what, you just did all of this for free. You didn't spend any money. Now, once you build up uh, an audience, let's say, do you, do you have a job? Uh, not really. No, not really, not right now? Okay, well, I don't know. Let, let's say you do like a retail job at Nordstrom, right? Um, and let's say you find that, you know, at the end of the month, I have like $25 left over. How about I give that $25 to a writer? Let me make a contest out of this. And so, hey, it's coming out of your own pocket, but that attracts even more attention. And then if you've been, uh, especially, you know, you've been publishing works by your friends and your friends know about this, and you already have, um, 
a group of support with them, perhaps the next time you do a contest, they can chip in too. Maybe you can offer 50, 75, $100 even. And if you decided to make this contest say, you know what, we want, we want Asian American writers, Asian American crime writers in Cali. That's what we want for this particular contest. Well, you're going to get a lot of entries. <laughs> I can tell. You're able to give a cash prize. A lot of people are going, to, are going to apply. And it doesn't even have to be much. I mean, $100 in the grand scheme of things is not a whole lot. But you'll still submit to a competition for that, right? <laughs> so, so that right there, you're already expanding your reach. And you know what you're also doing? You're being a gatekeeper. You're being that person who, in other contexts, would intimidate you because you don't fit what they want. But now you are that person. You've also built up a network, a huge network, of creative people with similar interests, similar tastes, who look up to you, who respect you. So that is an immense amount of power. And this is all being done through the internet because the internet breaks down the, all these different borders. On the internet, it doesn't matter that maybe by the time you do this, you're only like 21, 21, 22 years old. It doesn't matter because you've already, for a couple years, been showing people, demonstrating that you care about others. It's not just yourself. Like, you're writing your own stuff. You're still putting your own stuff on that website. But it's not just you. You're not the epicenter. And that <clears throat> same principle is what we've done with LCG. With LCG, when we came out, like, yeah, we got a bunch of press, so we were able to like, get a bunch of submissions, and a lot of people knew about us. But we were still the new kids on the block. We were still hadn't proven ourselves yet. So. We had to make an extra effort to branch out and bring in as many people as possible and show people that we really do put others first. We're not just about ourselves. And you can demonstrate the same kind of thing. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, OK, I was able to get this enormous press. I'll tell you how I got this press. I got it because, excuse me, uh, press coverage. I got it because I had befriended journalists. I had gotten to know journalists, um, fortify relationships with them, and they gave me opportunities. Well, here's the thing about journalism. Does anybody in here know very much about journalism? Like how it works? No? I do oral history if you consider that journalism. Um, that's a type of journalism. A um, little different than what I'm talking but it's similar. Um, so journalism, like your nightly news, uh, NPR, um, your national news, it runs on three principles. Does anybody know what those three principles are? Of how they choose news stories. Wouldn't it be like your audience what like your catch to what will catch your audience's attention and then like the importance of it like if it's like national or just like town wise yeah. that is along the right track all right um you're like right in the ballpark there you, you are um so yeah what, what you said about the audience like if it's local or it's national it has to have local interest even if it's national it has to have local interest if it's international it has to have local interest this is why, let's say, um, there's a natural catastrophe, like in the Himalayas. If any Americans died in that, in that say, avalanche, if any Americans died in that avalanche, what are they going to say in, in American media? So, going, American died. so many Americans died. <laughs> and they'll put the Americans dying before they put anyone else. This isn't a specifically American practice, by the way. I was in Spain when, um, I want to say it was like a train crash occurred or something, 
And in the Spanish papers, they put the Spanish people who died. <laughs> or I've seen where, um, you know, no Spaniards died there, but there was a Spanish tourist who was in the area who saw the aftermath, and so they interviewed him. <laughs> or her. Uh, same exact thing happened in Japan. I was in Japan once, and a boat capsized in Korea, uh, which happens quite often, actually. Uh, it was a ferry boat, and there were like, there, there was about 100 casualties and three Japanese people, and they only talked about the Japanese people. Because, like it or not, and this is perhaps a, a shortcoming of humanity, but if, well, Adam Smith said it best. He said, if 100 people, Adam Smith lived in Scotland, if I read in the paper that an earthquake in China killed 100 people, I will weep for them up until the moment that I prick my own finger. So yeah, when something immediate happens to you, it will affect you more than if it's far away. And that's just human nature. So journalism plays off of that. It has to be local. It has to be urgent, which I think you also mentioned. There has to be an urgency to it. You need to know it. Um, and also, it has to have a larger human interest. So sometimes you'll see, like how many times have you seen a story, say, uh, a new story at like a zoo in China when they have a new panda? Does a panda being born in a zoo in China really have anything to do with what's going on here? No, but humans love cute animals. <laughs> they love cute animals. And so that trumps everything else. <laughs> Human interest. So it has to have those three factors. Now, going back to this website we've created for you and this movement that you have started, bringing in all these people from all over the West, giving them a platform to tell their stories in the way they want to tell it. And you're so young as well. You're doing this at such a young age. Journalists will eat that up. They would love that story. You could contact the Gazette, you can contact the Denver Post, Independent. You're right here in Colorado College, the paper that they have here, which I can't think of the name of. Um, but KRCC, the, the local public radio station. All of those places, they might not do the story, maybe not all of them will do your story, but more than likely one of them will, maybe even two. Also morning shows, radio, all places that you could reach out to, like, hey, I have this amazing website, I'm doing this stuff, oh, and I'm running a contest. Because like the contest or these series, they give an extra immediacy. Because a lot of times, uh, anytime I've ever done a radio interview, what they always want to know is, do you have something coming out? Do you have an event coming? That is how they have to frame it. So hey, urgency. I'm, urgency. what's that? Urgency. Yeah, urgency. So you know, you're doing this, this contest, and hey, the winner gets $50. It's just for a short story crime, crime story uh, contest. Oh, when, you, when is your deadline? Deadline is like next Wednesday? Perfect. We'll have you on Monday in the morning. That, that is how these interviews happen. And once you've set up these interviews, once you've made these contacts, Stay in touch with those journalists. Because then, any time that you have something else go on in your life, you can reach out to them and tell them, and they will bump you to the front of the line, so to speak, in order to give you exposure. So, any questions you have on that? <laughs> I think I've given you an idea. Like, like you, you have a look on your face like, I'm going to do this, actually. <laughs> yeah, because like for my oral history, because mm -hmm. we are pretty much we are a journalism-based class, right. and for the project I'm working on, we're trying to figure out how to branch out a little bit more mm -hmm. due to what we were talking about. So I have a few ideas. Yeah. yeah. Well, great, great. I am glad. I am very happy this presentation helps you with that for sure. Thank you. So. That, that brings me to this, this is next point about 
building community is more than just giving an opportunity to someone. It's more than just giving a prize to someone or an award. Building community is about building relationships as people. As creative people,